Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Ann Russo in Women's and Gender Studies, and uh, this is a course, uh, WGS 391, Methods and Scholarship in Women's and Gender Studies. And today we are very excited to have Professor Lourdes Torres, who is a Vincent DePaul Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies here at DePaul University. Her research and teaching interests include sociolinguistics, Spanish in the US, queer Latina literature, and the, part, the focus of today, uh, Latina lesbian organizing in Chicago. She's the author of Puerto Rican Discourse, a sociolinguistic study of a New York suburb. She's also the co-editor of Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism. And with Anne. With me, yes, and Chandra Mohan. <laughs> and also of um, a collection called Tortilleras, Hispanic and the Latina Lesbian Expression. Uh, she has articles published in a wide variety of places, including Literature and Education, the Journal of Lesbian Studies, and she's also the editor-in-chief of the journal uh, Latino <laughs> Studies. Um, she is the recent recipient of the 2021 Frank Bonilla Public Intellectual Award. This was an honor bestowed by the La uh, Latino, Latino, Latina Latino Studies section of the Latin American Studies Association. And they recognized her leadership as a quote, anchor of Latinx studies in the Midwest and beyond. And one of her uh, major contributions, I think, is really uh, this recent focus on these two foundational organizations in Chicago, uh, Yena and Amigas Latinas. She's also currently working on a history of Yego, a national Latino LGBTQ organization that ran from 1987 to 2004. So I'm gonna turn it over. Thank you so much for uh, coming in. I, we've been friends for a million years and uh, you're an amazing scholar and, and activist. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now to, uh, to present. Great. Oh, well, thank you, Anne, as always, for inviting me to talk about my work, which I love to do. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you all as you embark on your own projects and um, really interested in engaging in a discussion with you around, um, you know, methods of how do you do this kind of research and um, um, what are some of the obstacles that come up as you're doing this work. So um, hopefully after I, I talk a little bit about my work, we can get into some of that. So I thought what I would do is um, uh, share um, uh, uh, some of the work I've done up on uh, Yena and um, Amigas Latinas. Quickly go through a, a slideshow that I usually do where um, I spend more time on, but I want you to, the, the images are really cool, I think. So I wanna share those with you and um, give you a little, a bit of a sense of the project and then we can talk about it. So I'm gonna share my screen. And can you see the, yeah, cool. Okay, so um, what I look at in my research is Latina lesbian organizing in, um, in Chicago. Okay, let me just look at the time here. And so I, um, I look at these two organizations, uh, Yena, which ran from 87 to 1991 and uh, Amigas Latinas, uh, which ran from 1995 to 2015. And what inspired me to do the work was actually reading another, an article, which I think Anne shared with you um, by Horacio, um, what's his last name, Rivera, um, who wrote this really beautiful, moving article about organizing, queer Latino organizing, in, um, in California, in LA, in San Francisco. And I was really moved by that article, the way he described the challenges and the accomplishments of, of, of the, the queer Latinos. I've never written it, read anything about Latino queer organizing. So I found that really powerful. And I was doing that at the same time that I was a member. I, I mean, I read the article when I was a member of um, Amigas Latinas, um, in, the, in the early 2000s when I had just come out to Chicago and was really happy to find the group. I joined the organization and I became part of the board after about four or five years. 
And I thought, wow, you know, this organization that I am a member of is really doing really cool work and um, creating space for, for, for women. And that's what got me interested in, in documenting that history. I felt like it wasn't anywhere. There's very little information on queer organizing in the Midwest in general, and even less on queer uh, people of color organizing. When we hear about the LGBTQ movement, we normally hear that it's a, a New York and a, 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 a California kind of coastal movement. That's generally what we hear about, although that's changing now and we're getting more access to, to, to more stories and more places. But uh, um, when I started this project, there's very little on queer organizing by people of color in the Midwest um, and nothing about lesbian organizing, which I was, um, as a member of this group in this community, I was interested in seeing um, that as part of the historiography of um, the queer movement. So I started the project and um, as I was reading the, the, the news, I started looking at newsletters and just the material that I had access to as a member of the group. There wasn't an archive yet um, at the Gerber Hart Museum. It's just as a member, I was secretary for a while. I worked in the office, so I had access to all these records. I started looking through them and I got interested in, in um, pursuing this as a, a, an intellectual project um, and writing about it. And as I started doing the research, I realized that there was a, um, well, let me tell you, the goals of, of the project were to document this history, as I said, because um, very little of that history has been written. And um, so in, in addition to documenting it, I was interested in the question of sustainability. How, you know, why do organizations grow and um, how come some organizations last a long time and others um, only last a year or two? And so I was interested in, in looking at that also. Um, I started looking at Amigas Latinas, but I found out that, that, that a, a, another Latina lesbian organization ran before that, before 1995. So I got interested in that and started talking to people and researching that. And so I was interested in both of these organizations, how they brought the identities, these um, identities of being Latina and lesbian, how did they bring those together? Um, how they, because Latinas is, a, um, Latinos, Latinx people are a very diverse group in terms of uh, national and ethnic histories, linguistic differences, politics. I wondered how organizations that, that identified themselves as Latino actually ended up um, representing all those different um, constituencies. And I was also interested in how they worked with other, or if, and how they worked with other groups. And so in terms of methods, um, um, it was a multi-method, um, uh, um, I, I used multi-methods in order to get at the questions I was interested in. I conducted uh, oral interviews with leaders of both Vienna and um, Amigas Latinas. I did archival research. As I said, I was a member of Amiga, so I had access to minutes, correspondence, flyers, newsletter. When I got in touch with leaders and did interviews, I asked them for any, any old materials they had, and many of them were, were willing to share with me. And then I did a media analysis. I looked at the, um, the queer uh, gay newspapers in uh, Chicago. And um, these you can find at, at uh, Gerber Hart or at um, uh, the History Museum, or a lot of the stuff is now online. So I was looking for any mention of the two organizations that I um, was interested in. And also I was interested in um, the, the, the people who were leaders anytime they came up in the news. And as I said, I, um, I participated in participant observation because I was a member of, of Amigas Latinas for, um, for about 15 years and also a member of the leadership of the org. So now I'm just gonna go through very, because I wanna spend time talking with you. Um, 
just show you some of the images. This is the, the leader of, uh, of Yena, the first organization. Um, and this is Amparo Jimenez who came to Chicago from Mexico looking for uh, other, for community, didn't find any uh, organized la Latina group. So she started one and the one she started was called Yena. She was active in um, working on uh, AIDS, uh, um, um, educating the community, the, the Latino community around issues dealing with AIDS. Remember this is the 1980s and she was an incredible leader and a, a huge force. And she was um, really instrumental in bringing Yena. She wrote a column in, in the Windy City Times, which um, was English, right? It's an English language press, but um, she was able to convince the uh, editor, Tracy Bame, to write a column in Spanish for Latinos. And she did that for a number of years. This is one of the Yena meetings, a picture from 1989. Lots of women, lots of um, um, lots of folks that I, I can name and uh, talk to you about at some time. Uh, Yena participated in marches. They did really, really bold things at that time, like um, uh, marching in the gay pride parade as Latinas. That was something new in the 80s. And they also had a presence in 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 uh, the uh, the uh, Mexican parades and Puerto Rican parades. They um, marched in these things at great risk at that time because that kind of stuff wasn't done then. Um, the group came around, as I said, in the '80s. This was a time when. Um, we had a lot of uh, an explosion of, of, of writing uh, by uh, lesbian and other women of color. These are some of the titles. And, and definitely the group was informed by some of that. Um, some of the, the people in the group created a newsletter. This is uh, unfortunately only one number of the newsletter was produced. I was able to get a copy of it. This is the cover. It's called Lesbiana, right, right out there. That was the title of the newsletter. And uh, it was bilingual and it had, it, had, it had some really wonderful articles. It was a shame that it never um, took off in terms of a more publication. Yena also did a lot of cultural events. They had um, uh, uh, poetry readings, they had theater. They were very interested in, uh, in, in um, performing Latina lesbian life for, um, for the community. And they also organized a really cool dance party every year, uh, the International Women's Day Dance, which um, was collaboratively um, organized by all women of color groups. Um, at the bottom of the flyer, you see some of the co-sponsors of this um, group, of this uh, year's dance. It was the uh, Chicago Women in Trades, the Literary Exchange, uh, Yena, and, and other groups. Um, very cool. It disbanded in 1991 after only uh, four years. Um, some of the reasons um, from talking to people, they talk about the, the struggles in maintaining the focus of the organization. Some people wanted it, it to be political, other people a social group. There were class and education differences uh, that surfaced, there were language differences, and there were personal relationships within the leadership and, and uh, membership that were sometimes unhealthy and um, a lot of alcohol, <laughs> including at the meetings, which didn't help um, keep things um, um, from becoming complicated. And so that uh, organization ended in 91. In, in the 1990s in Chicago, there was a lot of queer people of color organizing. Here are just uh, examples of some of the groups that were running at that time. And a new group that formed was um, um, Amigas Latinas. That's one of the founders of that Cardona leading a meeting. Uh, she had been um, a member of, uh, uh, of WACT, which was uh, women of color and cultures together. They used to have a potluck. In fact, they still do, they're still running. They have a potluck once a month to bring together women of, color, of all colors and cultures. 
and modeled on that um, 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 way of organizing. Um, um, if I talked to some other Latinas and they decided they'd form their own group and they started by having platicas every uh, once a month, they would get together on um, the third Sunday of the month from two to five and have uh, um, a potluck at somebody's house and have they'd always have a topic to talk about. And so these are some of the flyers from the platicas. They're around all types of subjects on um, uh, politics, on sexuality, on um, um, transgender issues. There were all kinds of issues. And I could talk about those later if you'd like. In 2003, Amigas became um, a 501c3 organization which, um, get, you know, so it became a much more, for, this was a way of getting funding for the activity. So people were interested in becoming uh, a nonprofit organization. Um, they created, we created a mission statement, outlined our vision and our values as one does when one becomes a nonprofit. Um, one of the reasons, uh, um, unlike Yena, um, Amigas Latinas ran for um, 20 years. And I think one of the years it was successful and it was able to run for so long was that it um, created all these subgroups that dealt with some of the differences that were not dealt with with Yena. So and there was a young women's group, there was a group in only Spanish, there was a group for elder, for women who were older called Madurando Elegantemente, there was a book club, there was um, an, um, a, a, a subcommittee called PFLAG in Espanol for families of, of queer folk, and then there were uh, lots of parties and um, picnics where everybody came together. So this multifaceted program, I think, helped keep the organization viable for a number of years. And they did other projects like um, uh, do a survey of the community to look at some of the issues, um, particular to Latina lesbians in Chicago, something that had never been done before. Um, Amigas Latinas participated in immigration rights marches in in, the, in 2006, and in all, you know any time there was an issue that affected our community, um, we were out there representing Amigas Latinas. We also participated in transnational organizing and discussions with. Um, Latin American lesbians in meetings um, in Latin America. And in conclusion, um, what is the legacy of Yena and Amigas Latinas? I think important, important a couple of important things to point out um, were that um, first it, it created a space, um, both these organizations created a space for um, queer women in Chicago, which didn't exist before. Um, it pushed the, the Latino community to be accepting of queer women, and it pushed the LGBTQ, mostly white organization to make a space for um, uh, Latinx perspectives, really uh, put Latinx or uh, Latina issues on the map in, in the city, in both the, La the Latino community and in the LGBT community. Developed a lot of coalitions with other group, with uh, queer Latino men, with um, Affinity, a black lesbian organization, with Kuli Zaban, which was an Asian organization that ran um, in the 90s also. So uh, not only were uh, Latina uh, lesbians uh, organizing on their own, they were also forming coalitions with other people. And it, it created a space to develop uh, queer Latina leaders, a lot of the people who were leaders of, of um, both of these organizations went on to do other things. Amparo Jimenez went on to be uh, um, uh, involved in forming newspapers, queer newspapers all over Latin America. Um, people like Mona Noriega um, became, um, she was the um, 
was she was the highest ranking Latina in the um, in the last go, uh, mayor's um, cabinet. She was um, working on diversity issues. Uh, Yvette Cardona is um, a lead person at the Polk Foundation. So every, you know, skills that people learned in these organizations, they were able to carry on to other spaces. So I think all of these are examples of the legacy of these two groups. And that is it. Um, I'd be happy to talk about any part of that that you'd like to discuss. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna open it up. I also switched the camera so you can see that. Good. You can kind of see the other the people who are physically in the class. But we're gonna open it up for questions. Oh, there they are. There they are. I see them. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of move in. Those of you who are trying to move in a little bit. There you go. There they are. Okay, the questions are gonna come, I guess, through the chat. Yeah. Uh, I'll open the Oh, okay. So I'll I'll just respond to the questions as they show up. Uh, um, is that okay, Anne? Yeah, that's good. Thank so you. how how has being a participant observer changed your relationship to your research and your work? But, um, that's a good question, um, Liv. That's a really good question because sometimes it gets hard to. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the um, the the program I just did on on Amigas Latinas with um, Yvette and Mona, and um, how. Your perspective as a researcher is obviously um, multifaceted if you're a member of the organization as well. And what you the the um, the nice thing about being a researcher is that you talk to a lot of different people about that organization, and so your perspective is really uh, uh, much wider than any individual person in the organization. And so sometimes because our memories are what they are and our perspectives and politics are what they are, people have a very narrow or, or, or they have a much more narrow view of the organization based on their individual participation. And so I found myself sometimes in the discussion challenging some of the things that, um, that the other people in the panel were saying because what they were seeing as only as the history, if you talk to other people, they had other versions of the history. There's not one version. And so sometimes that's uncomfortable to, to, to bring up, right? Because um, their memories of things might be very different from how somebody else remembers something, which was the case in our discussion the other day. Um, and so that's what you, being an investigator, right? gives you, it gives you a, a much wider lens. It gives you access to different, um, um, different perspectives. It gives you a, a different picture, not that you ever get the truth, but you have more, um, more evidence of, of, of different truths that emerge when you do the research. And I think it was a good thing that um, by the time that the that the paper that I, the first paper I wrote about Amigas came out after the organization was no longer um, running because I think it, it uh, maybe some people didn't. And, and this is still the case as I talk to people about it. They'll tell me when they read my papers on Amigas, they'll say, you got that wrong. And it could be from their perspective, and it could be that I, I you know, I did get some things. Um, I didn't get at the whole truth of some things, but just like they have their perspective, I have my perspective as a researcher, and that's all it is. It's not the, you know, when I write these papers, I'm not saying here's the, the story of Amigas Latinas. It's a version of what I was able to identify and interpret, my interpretation, right? somebody else writing this history might come to different uh, conclusions than I did. So I think it's useful to remember that there's not just one version 
of these histories and these stories. And that um, depending on when you come into it and when you leave, your perspectives on, on, on organizations are very different. But it could be uh, uncomfortable to be a participant uh, observer <laughs> when the, or, the, the, the stuff you're writing about is still ongoing and is still part of, um, of people's experiences. Good question. Okay, uh, do people wanna ask their questions or <laughs> speak up or is you rather not? Yeah, do you all wanna just say them out? Yeah, I can, oh God. Okay. Yeah. You have to turn off, you have to mute yours and it'll come through this speaker. I muted mine, but then, can you hear me now? Can you hear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So my question is sort of related to what you just talked about, but um, how did other people in the organization feel about you like theorizing? Um, and like, how did you bring that to them? Um, and around like the organization and people's experiences. And then I also, I'm just like generally curious about um, how like people decided to um, locate their work like within academia or within like, um, like writing, um, like publishing things within academia. So um, like how did people feel about you publishing that within um, academic setting? And um, like what do you feel, feel like is the value of having this published um, within academia and then like was there tension between that? Um, and that also this is like sort of another question, but also thinking about that related to like the ten was there tension in the shift to nonprofit organizing as well? Good questions. Those are all good questions. So thank you. Um, yeah, you know, when some people uh, tell the story of, uh, the, of any organization, um, they, again, have their own perspective on what it was. And especially if, if they are founding, you know, they're people who created the organization and or or part of the leadership. Um, quite often, we, we want a certain version of that history to be what's public. We don't like to um, share our dirty laundry in public with anyone, right? Nobody likes that. Um, and I was actually very interested in the dirty laundry part <laughs> as I was doing the research based not only on my own experience within the organization, for example, when I was in the organization in the, two, in the mid, um, around 2006, 2007, we started having discussions about adding the T to the mission. Up until then, uh, Latina, Amigas Latinas had uh, articulated that it served the, um, the lesbian and bisexual community, Latina, lesbians, and bisexuals. Well, people started pushing back on that. People started saying, what about transgender people? And we had one person, Nicole Perez, for example, and you remember Nicole, who was very instrumental in pushing us. She, she identified as a, as a queer person. She didn't identify as lesbian or transgender. She said she was queer. And so she was pushing us, um, she was a member of the board, to open up what you know what our mission was and be more inclusive and that was a real debate within the organization and it was a contentious one in fact it was so contentious that when we decided to add the t to our mission and say that amigas not only advocated for latina lesbians and bisexuals but also for transgender people uh, she decided not to be on the board anymore because she thought the organization should be for women, for Latina lesbians who identify as Latina lesbians or bisexual. And when you say you're um, also advocating for transgender, what does that mean? Does that mean transgender women or do you include transgender men? And some people were uncomfortable with having that difficult discussion and being more inclusive of people who hadn't traditionally been part of the community. Right. 
And so it was contentious. In fact, we, I remember we had several platicas where it was very uncomfortable and people left upset because their particular perspective on this was not um, um, being um, adequately represented. And what ended up happening was that the board, minus the person who left, the board decided that the mission of the organization would be that Amiga Latina was after 2007, an organization that advocated for um, the, the rights, the experiences of Latina, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender and queer communities, right? This showed an evolution of the organization over time, but it was not an evolution that was accepted and um, desired by all of the, the membership. It was a top-down decision. I would think that after making that decision, uh, some people who were, um, uh, not willing to embrace those other communities, they stopped participating in the organization. For me, that kind of thing, this part of the history is fascinating, important, and, and you know, important to document and share with people. Also, as we're thinking of other people who might be reading this, not just academics, but activists, to think about these, these things come up all the time. The changes happen, cultural changes, um, other changes in an organization has to take that on. How do you do that? How do you do that without um, it becoming a minefield where people are hurt and devastated? How do you create this inclusive thing? I think that's interesting and important to share. So that's why I'm interested in the, in the dirty laundry part. Like what were the complications? These complications don't only didn't only happen in this case, they keep replicating in other instances. So maybe we can learn something from looking at how these things were dealt with or not dealt with, with um, these organizations. Another thing that was not dealt with well, which I write about, is the bisexuality issue. Right from the beginning, Amiga said that it advocated for and was inclusive of Latina lesbians and bisexuals. Well, as I talked to women who identified as bisexual, they said that's not true, that they really had trouble being bisexual within the group, that people were not accepting, that people were suspicious. That uh... So I think that's important to bring up and, and share. And I don't think everybody is really happy with me that I shared those things in public, in writing. So some people are not happy with that. And that's what I had to decide to do, knowing that, and I didn't know it, that some people were not going to be happy with me showing this side. People who are proud of the organization, like I am, a lot of them, a lot of people want this vision of the organization as this wonderful thing that it was, and it created a wonderful space. I think we also need to look at some of the problems that emerged and the obstacles to, um, to creating a healthy organization. So yeah, some people are not happy with me and uh, don't, um, you know, will say, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, these things have come up. And um, I, uh, so I have to put on my researcher uh, hat and say, well, um, this is my job to present this history with integrity. I try to do it ethically. I, um, you know, uh, but not everyone's going to be happy with the product. And that's um, the reality. People don't, um, people feel differently about sharing that kind of information. And I forgot what the other, I know you had other questions, so. Um. That's okay, if you want to, you can move on to a different one if you want. <laughs> okay, uh, other questions? Yeah, I, um, so I'm interested in nonprofit work and, you know, there are like, obviously like pros and cons whenever it comes to like dismantling, like, um, some of like, not just the hierarchy, but like the like power structures of not-for-profit work, but overall, like as a feminist, like researcher, like, I think one of the things that's scary about Capstone is, or like scholarship in general is like entering that space. Um, and so like both kind of in like um, not-for-profit work, which I see as like community work and um, in the scholarship space, how do you respond to um, 
may, perhaps like opposing um, feedback, maybe feedback that's not so critical whenever um, most of us like engage in feminist research, um, spend a lot of time on it and are very passionate about it. Um, like, what do you find is uh, your critical response? You mean to people from the uh, from organizations who aren't happy with what the work that you produce? Yeah, I think both organizational, if you can, both organizationally and then just in scholarship and the feminist scholarship realm of research and, and publications. Um, well, in terms of um, the organizations, I, again, um, you know, uh, not everyone, uh, people are live their lives in organizations from their particular perspective and depending on how much access they have to other opinions about what's going down, they might have a very limited perspective or it might be broader. And so maybe reading some of these things could be shocking and embarrassing. And so uh, one would hope that if we write with integrity and with a, um, a desire to, you know, that it's clear that what the intentions are in sharing things that are difficult, that it's in order both to leave a record and also to learn that people who read the work can maybe then help, it helps them identify potential issues that might come up in the space and maybe even think about how people have um, responded to them in other contexts, that that might be helpful in diffusing um, you know, potential issues that uh, arise in organizations. In terms of academia, I'm not sure what the question is, like how people, what, what, what's the question in terms of academia? For example, like, have you ever um, had a opposing um, viewpoint brought up to you that you've had to deal with in academia and how did you handle that behind your research? Um, I mean, I have, I think I have, uh, I think there are people who dismiss the research as unimportant because of the, of who it is focused on. And that is, um, not anything I can do anything about. If people don't value the work, then I don't think it's my job to, uh, make them, uh, you know, value it. Um, I think there's always when you, as an academic, what we're taught to be is critical. And so there's always going to be people uh, uh, who will criticize your work. And that's welcome. That's good. I want people to criticize it because right, right, right now I'm undertaking another project. And so I am, you know, learning from the, the things that I did in the past. And if I get critical feedback, that's wonderful because it helps me create um, a, a better product, a better project uh, uh, um, to write, perhaps, uh, you know, to take into consideration the, the issues that people brought up. And uh, maybe it pushes me to explain things better, to clarify things better. So actually I think that the, if, if critical feedback comes from a place of, um, of really trying to help you develop your, your project. And I think it's a, a great thing. Thank you. I have a question. Um, as a person who was a member of Amigas Latinas, uh, what are the collaborative efforts you think like contributed the most to the longevity of the organization? Um, well, um, I think it, it really had a lot to do with not trying to meet everyone's need, needs within a one context, which was what Yena tried to do. It tried to be everything to everyone. And so uh, Yena uh, Amigas Latinas was able to um, recognize that different women within the, the organization had different interests and in, um, for example, um, uh, Yvette talks about how when we, we would have these platicas and mostly it was a group of women uh, for most of the time, um, uh, their age running from like uh, late 20s to 50s and 60s. 
and uh, she noticed um, um, in uh, a certain period that uh, people were starting to come, 16 year olds and 17 year olds were starting to come to the group. And then you say, well, you know, you have to ask yourself, are the, the conversations that 30 year olds and 40 year olds uh, are having around these issues, the same types of conversations that are relevant to 16 and 17 year olds. And yes, there is a place for intergenerational sharing, but this, it, uh, the platicas that we were having, the, the, the topics that we were uh, talking about from the perspectives of older, uh, you know, women, didn't seem appropriate for 16 year olds. <laughs> Yet 16 year olds were looking for a space. There were young, these young Latinas coming and they wanted a community. And so what we did was help them start their own group, Amiguitas, right? Amiguitas is what they were called. And one of the, in fact, that first young women, woman who showed up became the, um, the leader of that subgroup. And so we funded them. We would provide a space. We would provide activities like um, um, they were interested in art. So we would get somebody to work with them around art projects. And that was the way, the, the, we, you know, so it, it took off really well. And there, it became a, a big group of young Latinas who then had their own space. They were also invited to, you know, some of our other activities, but not all of the activities. And then they had their own place, right? So that, that I think, being able to recognize different needs. We had... A, the group, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Latinas are very linguistically diverse. Some Latinas speak Spanish, some people speak English, some people speak both, some people um, speak other indigenous languages. So how do you have a platica a meeting for people when it brings in people who are dying for a space, a community, but they don't speak the language that's being, you know, the main language of the group. And we try to do things bilingually, which is really hard and really hard to maintain that intention when you get excited about something and you're talking, maybe you don't remember to translate that other language. So that became really frustrating for some of the Spanish monolinguals in the group. And so we created a Spanish language plática where women would go and have the same kind of plática experiences, but speak in Spanish. Right, and so that then they weren't. It wasn't as frustrating for for people. Again, there were activities where the picnics, the dances, um, where people came together of all age groups and language proficiencies. But there were also little spaces um, that were created. I wanted to start a book club. I'm a nerd, and so I love reading and talking to people. And so I started a book club for and uh, around Latina books, queer books, and it was great. We all the nerds <laughs> met, <laughs> and we did our little subgroup. Um, you know, so there was a, a a number of people who were interested in creative arts, and so in um, performing and poetry. So they created La Dulce Palabra, where which is space where they would workshop their work. And then they would do performances and all of us would come to that. So I think that was really a large part of um, what was uh, helped us sustain the organization over that time was um, diversifying uh, according to the needs of the group. Also, I, I have to say, I think that becoming, um, I think that this is one of the questions that the last person mentioned, um, becoming a non-for-profit, well, it is controversial, right? Um, for some groups think that you become part of the establishment. You have to, because, uh, you know, the motivation, uh, one of the motivation for doing that is to be, get, have more access to funding for the things that you want to do. But with that funding come all kinds of conditions and expectations and uh, um, some people see it as limiting and as um, buying into the system. And so, yeah, that was a controversial move to do that, but it also uh, um, allowed us to access a lot of uh, our funding for some of these activities and, and subgroups that we wanted to form. So I think that ultimately it was a good move to, um, to become a nonprofit. 
what was hard was that we were a nonprofit with, uh, we didn't have a paid staff. <laughs> and so it, everything was volunteer work. And when people have full-time jobs, it's difficult to run a nonprofit where you have all these obligations and responsibilities um, to, to manage. That's one of the reasons I think Amigas Latinas no longer exist because um, the, um, it, it, again, it's hard to do that work unless you are able to get funding to, um, to hire a staff. And we were never um, able to do that. We never did that. We didn't have grant writers that had the time and the space to develop that. And so we decided um, in 2015 that it wasn't viable anymore to keep doing the work when everybody was so overwhelmed with all the, their other responsibilities. So we decided it was time to close the group. Um, I know you already talked about um, when the board decided to include transgender and queer folks. And I was just wondering after that decision was made, if there were any specific actions or strategies that Amigas Latinas used to try and include those people um, within the group. What we did was continue to have, because one thing that was consistent through, throughout the life of the, um, the 20 year um, existence of the organization, there was a platica every month. There was a platica every third Sunday of the month for 20 years. <laughs> and so we, uh, we understood that making that decision, that kind of top-down decision that this was now gonna be the mission, was, was going to be um, uh, challenging for some people. So we had platicas around the issue and we invited um, trans folks who were Latino who, or Latina uh, to come to them. We would have films around the issue and then have conversations. Um, um, there was um, a, a trans man, Sebastian Colón, who had been, um, who transitioned from uh, and was now uh, um, Sebastian. He had been a Latina lesbian in the, in the past who we knew. He came to the group and shared his experience, shared his transitioning, shared the emotional, the, the medical, uh, all of the different um, aspects of it with the organization. And that was really powerful to have somebody willing to teach us and um, to take on the, um, the discomfort that some people had and do it and be there and be someone who had been um, a Latina lesbian. Right. And so there was, I think, more opening, more openness to listening and um, trying to understand the situation. So I think that's what we did. We try to have activities, invite people and have more interactions to hopefully um, have more communication and understanding between, you know, folks. I, was I see. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about being a public intellectual and sort of what does it mean to be both a community member and an academic and how you balance those roles and whether or not you feel like you're sort of bridging those gaps in your own work. Yeah, I mean, I think trying to, to make the work that one does accessible to uh, larger audiences is huge. I, I mean, I think that's what being a public intellectual means is taking the research that you do uh, and bringing it to a larger audience. So for example, when we wrote, um, we did a survey of um, Latina lesbians in 2007, it, we surveyed over 300 um, women and queer identified Latinas in Chicago. That had never been done before. We got funding to do this. We, did, we, we brought in um, researchers who, are, who do work with this survey type of research and we, we gathered all this data, it took a year to do the survey. We, we got over 305 um, respondents. It was a really long survey to fill out. So 
Um, it was really challenging, but we had a really good success rate. We found out things about the community, for example, that there was a high level of um, partner violence within the, the, the Latina lesbian queer community. And so we brought that to our group. We, we created workshops around that. We created workshops on how we can all deal with and inform each other and learn about um, 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 violence within our communities and respond to it. We got, again, always people from within the, the uh, Latina Amiga community. There were social workers in our community who worked around domestic violence issues and they were willing to come in and deal, you know, um, work with us around those issues. So I think bringing the information to um, larger audiences, responding to the issues that come up, trying to create solutions to some of the, 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 the issues is what um, is important to do. I think also, you know, um, many of us uh, try to write for different audiences. Uh, like Anne and I participated in the Public Voices Project. So we tr try to write editorials and things in newspapers for different audiences around some of the issues that we think are important and should get out there and be discussed beyond academia or beyond our, our little political spaces. Sharing that, trying to get more conversation, trying to work with people around solutions, I think is um, uh, really important. I see another question here. Can you talk more about how your research methods have changed over time? <clears throat> huh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think, well, one thing that I'm doing differently now than I uh, have done in the past, um, I'm, I'm doing this research now on a, a Latina lesbian, uh, not um, a, a LGBTQ organization, a national organization that, that um, ran for 17 years. It was the only queer Latino Latinx organization that has ever existed. And it tried to bring people together from around the country. It was very, you know, a multi-million dollar um, nonprofit that ran for 17 years. And it did a lot of work around AIDS in the 80s. And it advocated around a lot of other issues as the time went on. What I'm doing differently with this research probably is I'm working with somebody else. <laughs> and that's challenging and fun and um, interesting. So um, everything that I do, I do with a partner. And that means it's wonderful. You talk about things, you have different perspectives. So um, it pushes you to, um, to rethink some things that maybe you think is are just a way that that things should go, who, who to talk to, um, how to do the, um, you know, the, the research. So I think that's been uh, wonderful for me because I, I have found a, a, a person that's wonderful and great to work with. Um, and so that, that has changed, but um, I still, I, I mean, I love doing I love interviewing people. I have a nosy streak <laughs> and I love hearing people's stories and, and hearing about how they talk about things. So I, that's the, the fun part, the, the funnest part <laughs> is um, getting on, you know, Zoom now. It, one good thing about the pandemic is that everybody were, you knows Zoom and they, I can do interviews. We can do interviews with people from all over the world via Zoom. And it's just so wonderful to talk to people and to get their stories. Um, one thing, for example, that my partner um, uh, Leti recommends, which I hadn't thought about doing. So this is cool. She said, you know, we're talking to people from this organization that ran for 17 years. And um, uh, in addition to talking to people individually, let's talk to people in groups from the same period and have a, like a little focus group where everybody is, um, you know, uh, communicating, talking about what they remember, maybe rethinking based on what somebody else said. So I think that's a really cool idea to bring, to do group interviews. In addition to the individual ones to bring group interviews because that changes the whole dynamic and it, um, it can generate, um, um, uh, jar people's memory and just bring up different things that maybe you won't get when you interview people individually. 
So we haven't started that, but we're going to do it. And I'm excited about that new method of, um, of uh, interviewing folks. I think that's great. That's amazing. So thank you. I'm going to ask just one other question just mm -hmm. to close it out, which is sure. everybody in, the, um, in this class, they are engaged in their own research projects this quarter mm -hmm. and next quarter. And just from your experience, what do you have any advice that you would offer for people who are trying to, um, you know, do the kinds of research that you're doing, archival and or interviewing? Are there suggestions or just general suggestions you would give to people embarking, um, you know, on their own projects? I think being open to, um, it's best to not have to go in with thinking you have all the answers already. You know, sometimes we say, oh, I want to study this because of that reason, because I know this. And just to being open to what you might learn that is different from what you expect it uh, to learn or about the organization, about the people that you encounter. To be open also, people are very generous to always ask, you know, if you're talking to somebody to say, who else should I talk about? Who else should I talk to? That might be somebody who can give me some interesting insights because that widens the pool of who you talk to and who you talk with and um, will, you know, can lead to new avenues. So I think you start with a set of questions, but being open as you embark on the project to, to do discoveries and new avenues of investigation um, it could be really cool. You might end up, you know, um, thinking things are going to work one way and then come up with a, whole, a totally different vision and version of what you in, envisioned initially, which is cool to be open to that. Not to be freaked out by it because things aren't turning out as you thought, but to actually see that as an opportunity to maybe learn something unusual or different that you didn't think was there. And the archival work is, it's a, it's a, it's, I love that too. I love digging into archives. It, it, you know, it takes time. And I think what was good to, for me was not, I mean, to, it takes a hell of a lot of time, but to, as you're going through different sets of archives, reading things and looking through things that are, that again, don't um, immediately answer the questions that you might have, but might lead you to, different questions and um, different um, discoveries that if you're really one, you know, you have one um, vision of what things are, you uh, are put on blinders to other things that might pop up that might end up changing and um, enhancing, enriching your research. So I think just openness to discovery is uh, in any avenue is, is um, helpful and fascinating and you know it, it 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 can it's surprising and energizing and really cool <laughs> uh, thank you so much i really appreciate your time and your effort um and if people want to offer a thank you in the chat as well and then we'll be in touch and so thank you so much well, thank you all for listening to me. I love to talk about my research and I enjoyed your questions. Your questions are really smart. And um, I, I, good luck with all your projects. If I can help in any way, you can shoot me an email. I'd be happy to, um, to, to respond to questions that you might have about what I did or if it relates to something you're doing, um, feel free to shoot me an email and we can talk more. Thank you, Anne. This was fun.